Hey folks, it's Jeremy, the host of Blamo. Thanks so much for listening. This is a preview of one of our exclusive shows on Patreon. These are member-supported shows, meaning they only happen because of our incredible members and community. So check out a preview of the episode, and if you like it, consider joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Blamo, where we have tons of exclusive Blamo episodes, shows, our amazing Slack group, and we're adding new things for members all the time. If not, no worries, we still love you, and we literally have hundreds of episodes of Blamo all free for you to dive into. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Die Workwear Podcast. My name is Derek Guy, and my co-host is Peter Zotello. So every once in a while, someone will email me and ask me um, how they might be able to get into the tailoring trade, which is not a question I can answer because I'm not a tailor. But thankfully, uh, a friend of mine, Harry Sun, um, is a tailor. She's a bespoke tailor, and she started a bespoke tailoring company in the United States, which is really rare, um, given how difficult it is to uh, do this kind of work in the U.S. And most notably, she did it in the South, not in one of, you know, not in New York City or even San Francisco. It's really concentrated nowadays in New York City. Um, So she was in San Francisco recently, and I thought we'd have her on the pod to discuss uh, that exact question. How does one become a tailor? Let's dive in. Hey, Derek. Hey, Peter. How you doing? Doing very well. We have a guest today for the pod. We do. Um, her name is Harry, and someone I've known online for many years. She used to run a bespoke tailoring shop in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of the few bespoke tailoring businesses really in the U.S. Um, and surprising to some degree to have it in Nashville, which is not, you know, most tailoring businesses are in New York City. You don't hear about that too often being in Nashville. You don't hear about it too often. So welcome to the pod, Harry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Harry. Okay. And I I used to have a tailoring shop in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, unfortunately, it was destroyed by a tornado wow. in March of 2020. And then a couple weeks later, COVID began. Oh, wow. And then I, that just killed my tailoring business. Yeah, that's a one-two punch that'll drop most yeah. businesses. Um, but my background is I grew up in California um, in a town called Davis. Hey, neighbor. That's just <laughs> and, up the road. I uh, went to NYU. Nice. And while I was going to school for journalism there, I I don't know why I became really interested in clothing and making clothing. I had a friend um who was making clothing and she inspired me and um was yeah. she making men's clothing, women's clothing? She was making women's clothing. Okay. Tailoring um, or just clothing in general? Just like fashion. Oh, okay. Is that clothing? That's clothing. That's clothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll call it clothing. Yeah. Um, but I ended up taking some classes at um FIT, oh. pattern making and draping. Yeah. And then became interested in tailoring. I think I was always drawn to the kind of hand work aspect of it, just how a lot of things are done by hand. Um and shadowed someone there for a little bit. At FIT? Uh, no, in New York. In New York. Yeah, okay. in New York. And just learned more about tailoring and then moved to Nashville and then decided, you know what? I really like this and I want to study tailoring and I want to study tailoring where it first began. Hmm. So I applied to the London College of Fashion. Wow. And at the time they had a tailoring program. Did they? And so um, applied, got in, moved to London, lived there for a couple of years and studied tailoring. And I, yeah, I remember, um, when I first went to school there, I would walk up and down Savile Row and Mm. I would go into every tailoring firm and ask, are you taking apprentices right now? Yeah. And most of them said, said no. I think because I'm a woman, because I'm an American, right. They were just like, nope. (laughs) (laughs) But finally, there was one place, Welsh and Jeffries, and they said, you know what? Come back and you can help us out a little bit. And so they're a military tailor. And so Ah. I learned some stuff there. And then through connections at um, in school, I also became connected to someone who's working at Tom Sweeney in Mayfair. And so that's where under uh, my friend Matt, he trained me and was my mentor. And I learned cutting, pattern making, fitting. Is that Matt Gonzalez? Matt Gonzalez, yeah. Now he's working as an independent bespoke tailor. Yes, he is. Yes. Yep. Have you, so you originally went to school for journalism. Mm-hmm. Was that you were on track to do kind of like news journalism, kind of like like mm. politics or? 
No, I wanted to work in magazines. Nice. Style magazines. Oh, okay. specifically style magazines. Yeah, like general culture magazines. Oh, At I the see. time, there was this magazine called Tokion. That was my favorite <laughs> I magazine. Heard of it. And I wanted to work. Th- they have since folded. Mm. Um, when I was graduating from school, that's when there was a big recession. And all of the magazines that 08, I. 08? Yeah. 2010? Well, yeah. I graduated 2009. Yeah. And so all the magazines where I wanted to work just began to close yeah. and yeah. I didn't want to stay in New York City either mm. so so what were the what were the courses that you took at FIT I took pattern making and draping is it my understanding is that um, these courses are I should say that the the career path is different for a bespoke tailor versus someone who's learning to do pattern making at a factory mm. is that true yes I mean each tailoring shop does their patterns differently. I think some people, some cutters on Savile Row just draft from scratch straight onto the fabric Mm. each time. Each time for each each order. Yeah. And then, or each like, yeah, each time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because there's a set of kind of general formulas for chest, for like the back and the side body and front where you kind of know, okay, this is their chest measurement. The half chest will be this much. Mm. Half waist will be this much. Half hip will be this much. And then you kind of like grid it out on the fabric. So when you're going to these these courses, are they teaching mm-hmm. you the industry kind of factory production method of mm-hmm. pattern drafting or are they teaching you the bespoke method? So at FIT, it was the kind of more production Production. Method. Yeah, okay. or just not production, but basically you use a dress form. Mm-hmm. You take the measurements of the, that particular dress form and then you make a pattern to fit that dress form. You know, you mentioned something about draping, mm-hmm. which I only heard for the first time by tailors that are working in costume departments at the San Francisco Opera. Oh, cool. And they use draping as a term to put over mannequins. They would drape the fabric over the mannequins. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Mm Because for me, that was the first time. uh, I will only say this because as menswear nerds were fixated on what terms they use in the UK or in Italy, not too much here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I heard the use the term draping. Can you get into that a little bit more Mm -hmm. in detail? Well, so I took pattern making and draping. Pattern making is you look at the dress form, take the measurements of the dress form, and then use those measurements on paper to create a pattern. Whereas with draping, you start with fabric or muslin in this case. You put it on the dress form you drape and you it kind on. Of, you drape it on and you pin it mm. and then you create a pattern from that draped fabric. Whoa. So it's like, it's w- pattern making is one approach of making a pattern for a figure. And then draping is another approach. Yeah, that's the first time I had ever heard of it. That was only but six draping, months ago. But draping, a lot of designers will drape on the dress form because the, they want to create, I don't know, like a crazy shape or detail or something. So they'll just pin it on the dress to form. To see how it lays. To just see like that's part of their creative process. Mm. And so they'll pin fabric on the dress form and kind of see how it looks. And I believe then someone else comes in after them and then translates that pinned design to a pattern. Oh, wow. Paper yeah. pattern. Paper pattern. Gotcha. So it's yeah. draping sort of almost like kind of like molding the fabric, kind of sculpt- sculpting yeah. the fabric yes. into mm-hmm. a garment. And I feel like when I was working as a tailor, I felt like both methods were really helpful because mm. when you're doing the fitting process, sometimes you just have to like rip out the collar and rip out the shoulder and kind of drape it on the figure right. to know, to make it fit best. Because when you're approaching it from the pattern, from pattern modifications, you can only conceptually go so far in your mind. You know, you kind of have to assume, well, they have a drop right shoulder. That's like a quarter of an inch, I think. So I'll see how that works. And then sometimes you just have to drape. Yeah. So then you go to London and what courses did you take in London? I mean, I took, I was in the foundation tailoring program. And so we had, um, you know, we learned how to make trousers, waistcoat, coat, jacket. Um, and then, yeah, like learned how to design stuff too in for the computer. Pe- for people who want to become a bespoke tailor, do you feel it's necessary to take those courses or do mm. you feel that most of the learning is done at like Walsh and Jeffries as an apprentice? I guess. I mean, you know, there were people who were in my program who were interested in pursuing a career in fashion. Um, so maybe they wanted to become a menswear designer, but they wanted to study tailoring to get there. I'd say if you want to be a bespoke tailor, it just depends on what kind of tailor you want to be. 
But if you want to be like a traditional bespoke tailor, I feel like you don't have to go to school. You can just learn from someone for sure. But you only learn their method, you know? Oh, as opposed to various methods. I mean, in school, I feel like, in school, I felt like there was a kind of open approach. You know, we were learning this particular instructor's technique, but they'd always say, yeah, but like people do it differently. I do it this way, but your other teacher maybe does it this way. We had two teacher, two or three teachers. And so then I kind of thought, well, I guess whatever way I like to do or whatever, I don't know. I find that there is a difference. I don't know if this is too controversial, but I find that there is a difference in generational and regional attitudes on those things. Like Mm -hmm. older Italian tailors constantly slag off how another tailor does something. Oh, because yeah. There's this never any <laughs> this is the way you yeah. do it. And anyone else who does it differently is a moron. They're, yeah. they're a cheat. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it looks ugly, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, then, they did it that way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, isn't it supposed to be very intense in Naples? Like all the tailors just talk shit about each other they constantly. Do. Yes. They do. <laughs> in Naples specifically, yeah. the only one that I found that uh, holds... Everyone regards with a lot of respect as Rubinacci, uh, partly because they respect the business that uh, the family has built. Like they think it's mm. pretty impressive that they've built this, like, you know, very reputable, yeah. world renowned tailoring house. But generally speaking, they all kind of talk crap about each other, except for Rubinacci. Mm. Um, whereas in, in London, and especially among younger tailors, I find that there's more camaraderie. Sh- there's just more there's just more openness sharing um yeah i will say in sicily it's very similar to naples insofar as they tend to keep those secrets to themselves whereas the younger tailors like salvo who's only in his 30s he's like we're dying so mm. if we don't share these secrets uh, those secrets are going to die with us yeah so we need to share these secrets and i i find that younger tailors especially there's it's not uncommon anyway to meet younger tailors who are also interested in fashion like davide tab um yes, yes. and fred nidu are all kind of interested in the fashion world whereas mm. older tailors all kind of think that that's just dreck you know yeah. like it's just <laughs> um, it's just what just just like garbage, garbage. Oh. you know like it's just kind <laughs> of like a con and ugly stuff oh and that's so for stuff. the common man yeah yeah Huh. Um, it's weird. I mean, for me, I'll tell people that I make clothes or that I was a tailor and people will say like, oh, you're a designer, you're a fashion designer, you have your own brand or something. But I still think of myself as like a tradesperson. Mm. I don't, I think of myself as like a, like an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm doing this stuff and it's very utilitarian and it happens to be for things that people wear. Your experience in the apprenticeship reminds me of mine in the electrical apprenticeship. Oh, you're an electrician. I'm an electrician. Are you a licensed electrician? I am a licensed California electrician. Wow. And I went through 5,000 hours of on-the-job training. So Mm -hmm. actually have a a journeyman that I work with that trains me. And then I had the class time. So in the class time, they said, very similar to your experience, we had multiple instructors. You can do it this way. You can do it that way. But when you're with your journeyman, do it his way. Mm. And then when you become a journeyman yourself, then you can do it any way you want. You have the choice. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, when I had a journeyman, it was very much do it this way. Mm. This is the way I want you to do it. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. now that I'm a journeyman, I can, it's electrician's choice. It's tradesman's choice. So you can pick and choose based on the different ways that you learned, both by various journeymen that I learned from and from the classroom training. And I'm sure it's the same with you. Mm, I guess, yeah, I think I had the training. But I mean, I think because I'm not Italian and because I'm not English, starting a shop in America it was a unique opportunity because there's, I mean, there's kind of a precedent with, you know, American tailors or Brooks Brothers, a sack suit or whatever, yeah. but... Well, American tailoring has always been much more factory dependent than yes, its European counterparts. Mm-hmm. So Brooks Brothers, I mean, they invented the ready-made suit in right. 1849. And ever since then, uh, American clothing has been much more about factory production, rated wear production mm-hmm. versus... Europe and going um, to a tailor just for alterations. Yeah, right, right, right. So it's that's one of the interesting things. Before we get into your shop, though, mm-hmm. what is the method that you learn at Welsh and Jeffries, and how does that differ from other places? You mean method for cutting, you know, pattern making? Um, want to hear the rest? Listen to the full episode and many more other exclusive episodes over on our Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash blamo to sign up and join the Blam Fam. You also get access to our exclusive members-only Slack group where we chat about this and a ton of other things. So head over to patreon.com forward slash blamo and we'll see you there. 